As I was mindlessly scrolling for a game to play, I was struck with a thought. Could a beloved game from my childhood run on my modern Windows 11 PC? Worms 2 was released in 1997, also the last year of the UK won Eurovision. But due to Windows' relentless obsession with backwards compatibility, I was wondering if it would just work. Heading over to good old games, I saw that not only did they have it, it was also only a quid. Not being able to pass up a bargain, I parted with £1 sterling, downloaded and launched it. However, all was not as it seemed. After that incredible intro movie, nothing happened. Uh, computer. Hello. Computer. Hello. After trying a few times to no avail, I headed to the comment section. It seems I'm not alone in my struggle to play Worms 2. There's multiple reports of it failing to play on Windows 10, and it seems that despite all the improvements of Windows 11, fixing Worms 2 is not one of them. The comment section has led me to this forum, where apparently there is a fix. However, it involves downloading a zip file and then copying over some random DLLs. Now I have two issues with this. One, not to doubt the integrity of Tzachita, but I'm skeptical of downloading and running code from a random 2012 forum post. And two, where's the fun in that? Maybe we can figure out what's wrong and fix it ourselves. How hard can it be? Okay, let's figure out why it's not running. My guess is that it's crashing somewhere in some sort of startup or initialization code. So let's run it under a debugger. I'm using x64 debug to see where it crashes. Huh. So the debugger never stops, which means it's never reaching main. What's happening to my process? I can see in the task manager it's still running. So let's run procmon, which is a Windows tool that shows all the real-time file system activity. And I can see here it's stuck in an endless loop trying to find and load winmm.dll, which according to the internet is a library for Windows legacy audio components. Although presumably it wasn't legacy back in 1997. So looking at the stack trace provided by Procmon, we can see that the code originates in ntl.dll. And this is why our code never reaches main. It's getting stuck in an infinite loop trying to do its initial library loading. So I've done a quick search for the string winmm.dll in the game files to see what might be loading it, and it's used by this mysteriously named win32.dll. So let's peek inside the guts of this mysterious DLL, and to do that I'm using Ghidra, an open source decompiler and disassembler. So the first thing I'm going to do is get a list of all the strings in this DLL. And I'm just looking through them and surprisingly, there's a GitHub link. So I've gone to this GitHub link and after a bit of reading, I've come to the following realization. This game assumes it will always be loaded from a CD, which was probably a fair assumption back in 1997. So that's where it's trying to load all the audio files from. What this library does is effectively patch winmm.dll so that any functions which try to load audio from a CD instead get loaded from a file and all the other functions just get passed through as normal. I guess GOG just ships this with old CD games. Anyway, there's a GitHub issue which says that it doesn't work on Windows 10. I've skimmed through the code and it looks fairly innocuous, so I'm going to clone it, build it, cross my fingers and import it into the game. Still broken, still endlessly searching for winmm.dll. So the GitHub issue says that it's due to the relative paths in the def file. So a def file is a Microsoft construct that allows you to map function calls when building a library. Basically, it says that when a user calls x, it should actually forward that call to y. And that's how this library forwards all the non-CD audio functions to the original DLL. You can see here that all these functions just get patched through to the WinMM DLL version, and that any of the ones that have been over overridden get passed to the uh, library's implementation. I can see from Procmon that it's searching in the right location for these DLLs. So I'm just going to remove these relative paths. And... <laughs> this glorious menu I have not seen in over two decades. So I played a few rounds to remind myself how bad I was at the game. <laughs> but something was still bothering me. The menu, specifically this option, feels off. Not only is it lost in the negative space, there seems to be something strange with the background. So let's grab a screenshot and open it up in Photoshop. There's clearly a hard edge around this menu option. 
I found a video recording of the original Worms 2 game, and there's another menu option. This is for network play, and referring back to GOG, we can see that the only multiplayer available is local multiplayer. But this got me thinking, if GOG is just patching libraries and removing menu items, then the code for the networking and the menu is probably still in there somewhere. So let's see if we can find it. So back to looking at all the strings in the binary, and I can see that there's a network menu string. So this lends credence to my assumption that the code is in there somewhere. However, there's no code that actually loads this string, or indeed any of the menu strings. So I've set a hardware breakpoint on the menu string, which means the debugger will stop when the string is loaded. So we just continue through until the program runs. Then hover over the menu item. Okay, so we've braked. So if I take this address and load it up into Ghidra, we can see that the string is loaded with a load string A function. And, acor and according to the dots, this, lo this loads a string from a resource. So a resource is a way to embed data directly into a Windows executable. This means the data is always available without having to distribute additional files. Using a tool called CFF Explorer, we can see all the resources in the Worms executable. So if we look into the bitmaps folder, we can see all the menu icons are actually bitmap resources in the executable itself, and these are loaded with the load image A function. So if we go back to our debugger, we can set a breakpoint on this load image A function, and in fact we can make it a conditional breakpoint so that it only stops when we load bitmap 211, i.e. the start campaign image from the resources directory. So if we look at the call stack, we can take the address of this function and then load that again, load that up into Ghidra. So looking at this, this is the function that loads the menu items. So in fact, looking at this, it actually loads two images, the normal one and then the on-click image as well. And in fact, actually, if we keep walking up the stack, we eventually end up at this function, which looks like it calls that double image load function multiple times. So this is probably the function that's being used to build the menu. It's loading one icon, and then another icon, then another icon. To prove to myself that this code is doing what I think it's doing, I'm going to patch the resource ID for the on-click image. Look at that. Now we need to figure out how clicking on an icon loads the next menu. And this was the start of my misery. So reading up about how Win32 Forms works, I found call window proc A, which is used to pass events down to sub-elements. So I set a breakpoint on this, conditionally on the on button event type, as there's loads of messages flying around, and sure enough, I can break when I click the button. So looking at the stack, we can see we start in a fairly standard Win32 message loop and eventually end up in this switch statement. So what I think is happening is that each button press fires an event with an ID this then triggers this function, which then uses the ID to decide which menu to render. And we can verify this by hacking around with the process memory. I can see that ID2 is on the stack. This is the ID of the campaign menu that we're trying to load when we click on the button. So let's change that. Let's just try making it one larger. And now we continue. And oh. We're at, the, we're at the network menu. Okay, so it turns out that the network menu is just one beyond the campaign menu. So that's a nice surprise. But the final piece of the puzzle is how can I patch the binary to do that? I don't want to have to attach a debugger and hot patch my memory every time I want to access this hidden menu. And it was here I lost a considerable amount of time, falling down rabbit holes and clawing myself out just to fall into the next one. I was tempted just to call it a day here. After all, I'd done about 90% of the work I set out to do, but there was this gnawing feeling in the back of my mind. I had to fix this last issue. When I get stuck like this, it's useful just to take a step back and ask myself, what do I actually know? And that is, pressing a button fires an event with an ID, and that ID determines which menu is rendered. So where does that ID come from? That seems to be the key to this puzzle. It's not easy to track down because when that message is fired, it disappears off into the Windows kernel, then pops out in our message handler. There's no clear path between the code that sends the message and the code that handles it. However, I've painstakingly traced the stack variable all the way up the call stack back to the original message handler, and it's this argument. 
In Windows, you can register a custom message handler function, which has to have this signature. And the last argument is for custom data. So someone somewhere is sending us a message and passing us two. There's two ways to send messages in Windows, set message and post message, with the former being blocking and the latter being fire and forget. So I've set breakpoints on these messages, conditionally on the last argument being two, and sure enough, it breaks when I click the menu option. Walking up the stack, we end up at this function, which calls post message A and uses two as the last value. It also does a similar thing with some other messages with different last values. So presumably this is some sort of um, button handler code. Anyway, I'm going to patch this two to a three and see what happens. Well, that works. However, my dreams of showcasing my lack of skills to strangers on the internet were dashed. As it turns out, the servers were switched off in 2020, which is presumably why GOG has removed the menu option. So whilst my hack might be a few years too late to be actually useful, the real prize is the breakpoints that we set along the way. Don't worry though, because the low level fun doesn't end here. If you want to see how I reverse engineered Rollercoaster Tycoon, then check out this next video.